Hi, everybody. We're Christine and Colin Poole. We are absolutely thrilled to be here with this panel talking about how we develop our own unique artistic voice. We have these amazing creators, all of whose work we totally admire, and we're thrilled to have all of you uh, attendees come and get to hear some of their wisdom. We think nobody on this panel needs real introduction, but we are going to have everybody just take a minute and say a little bit about who they are and what their work is like and what they've done. So uh, Donato, why don't you start? Yeah, all right. Wow. Uh, so I'm Donato Gincola. I've been a freelance illustrator for my entire professional career uh, for almost 30 years now. But uh, to get this uh, like artistic voice rolling, I thought I actually would be a comic book illustrator when I started. So we'll let you sit on that and uh, I'll pass the baton. All right. Ed? Yeah, I, uh, my career has, has been uh, uh, kind, kind of buried and hodgepodge. Uh, I, I've worked as an illustrator and concept artist, but my day job for the last 30 years has been as an art professor. Uh, in fact, I just retired in June uh, from my professorship. Uh, and I'm really loving retirement because I get to do uh, my artwork full time now. Uh, and uh, in terms of artistic voice, I'll, I'll follow Donato's lead. Uh, I started out as a graphic designer after failing in college as a concert pianist. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, uh, Alan? Oh, uh, well, my, uh, my tag up there says, uh, it's Victoria Thompson because I'm logged in under my wife's account, but I'm Alan Williams. and. Uh, I started uh, working in the uh, game industry in around 1988, uh, doing work for like uh, uh, you know various RPGs and stuff like that. Uh, but I ended up uh, over the course of years, I gravitated towards uh, concept art uh, and uh, narrative illustration for uh, books and covers and stuff. And mostly, I do my own artwork now. Uh, which I mean, if you uh, get a chance to see, uh, it's easier to look at it than it is for me to explain it. But uh, uh, but that's about it. Uh, I've had a long, I've gone through a lot of different, uh, you know, career paths. I've done uh, shows and illustration and even some mainstream, uh, you know, uh, illustration for like Suzuki and things like that in the past. But now I, I come out primarily do concept work uh, for a few months out of the year. And then it's all my own uh, personal work. And Scott? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Gustafson. I've been an illustrator for about 40 years. Uh, I've done primarily um, children's book type things, classic stories, children's literature. I kind of consider myself as more of a uh, family friendly illustrator. <laughs> so things are, might not be exactly for little kids, but they're usually on the lighter side. Um, and I too have had a varied um, thought I was going to be an animator when I was in high school and in art school and then found that I loved painting and drawing and uh, kind of doing all the things that an illustrator does as opposed to the one thing that an animator would do. So um, anyway, that's that's kind of in a nut case, <laughs> in a nutshell, that's kind of what uh, what I've been doing. Now I'm kind of doing, allowing myself to do just more fantasy type work, uh, not allowing myself, that's just getting the opportunity to do that. Uh, do individual paintings as opposed to considering, you know, 30 or 40 pieces for a book. Uh, so that's fun to vary the, vary the subject matter and try different things. And I primarily work in oil paint. Excellent. So you all have uh, wildly distinctive voices in your work, and it's part of what we absolutely adore about everything you make. And we'd like you to share with our attendees, I know this is starting with a really difficult question, um, what you feel has kind of been the path of you developing your creative voice, if that's how it came to be, and has it evolved? throughout the course of your career. Is there a common thread that you can find? I know some of you have kind of morphed from material to material and sometimes the work shifts a bit. Talk to us a little bit about how you feel your voice actually came to be. How did you get so distinctive and unique? Let's go with Alan. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> well when I, we, it's interesting because when I first started, I got, um, I think I did what a lot of people do. I would look at other artists that I, I liked and I would think, you know, 
uh, I would try to find as much of it as I could about these all these various you know techniques because I thought you know maybe one of the questions I can remember asking people a lot and I get it a lot and I'm sure everybody on this panel if they've ever talked to a student gets it how do you paint skin tones right that's a really prevalent part. and then of course the answer is always it depends right but when I was when I was asking that question I thought knowing that process would give me what I wanted to get, but it isn't, it, it had nothing to do with it in the long run because so many, everybody had their own process. And so one of the first things I learned early on, uh, I guess, was that um, you sort of have to, you can ask people and you can follow their process, but you have to kind of come out, you have to have your own internal process for doing things. And so uh, as, it, as I grew into it, I started to uh, actively pay attention to the things that I liked to do and in the course of learning how to do the things I was supposed to learn how to do, I de determined to myself that I would never lose the ability to do the things I also liked to do for myself. From you know, the things that made me feel satisfied with artwork. Like, um, for instance, like I, I love looking at Greg Manchester's work and, 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 the pe and people who paint like him who are very, you know, they're very expressive and, you know, they, they're, they're all about the, the stroke and how the paint lays down. I love looking at it, but it drives me crazy to, to try to paint that way. I love getting lost in a piece in detail. And so one of the things that I tried to keep in mind when I do think about that is when I'm trying to be looser, I'll think about how Greg and, and people like him work, but I'll also remember to pay attention to the stuff in myself that I need to have in the piece that I need to have come out of it. And uh, that took a long time, actually. That was probably, it took me, I said I started in 1988, but it was probably around 2000 or 2002, actually, when, when my kid, when my first kid was born, that I started actively deciding to look at all this the artwork that I like. And I, I, the thing that made the most sense to me was if I liked something, I had to find out why I liked it. And if I, if I could figure out why I liked it, I more than likely wanted to incorporate that aspect of it into the stuff that I was doing. Right, so uh, I, I just started collecting imagery and I started doing things like going onto online forums and exploring. And I really actively tried to find my, the voice that I had sort of been circling around this whole time, you know, because if you go back and look at a lot of the work, you can see every now and then you can see bits and elements of stuff that are showing through now. Uh, but it's, it's almost like there was a time when you would walk into my booth and people would say, this looks like seven different artists are showing together because I was exploring so many different techniques and processes, you know, uh, but that's kind of what you do when you're figuring things out, you explore. Yeah, and, so it's like Alan, like it was about what, 10, 11 years ago when you were at the IMC and that voice was really starting to come out. Right, yeah, that's, IMC helped a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, because I, I, I got into, you know, when I, when I went into IMC, the Illustrator's Masterclass, if you're not familiar with it, uh, uh, it was one of the first times that I'd ever worked in a room with other people working at the same time. I mean, I did a little bit of that in college, uh, but this was like after having been a professional for a while, getting back into it. And it, it was the most calming, peaceful thing. And it was almost like being in a room with other people looking for their voice. My Everything quieted down and I could actually feel what I wanted to do. Uh, so it was incredibly valuable. And, you know, any of these, uh, like they do mentorships and stuff now too. Uh, and all of those things to me are, are incredibly worth it because it's very targeted, you know, for you to, to, to just, to, you know, to explore and to, to find your own, you know, way of doing things too. And you asked earlier about, uh, about how it evolved. And I, I actually feel like uh, it's constantly evolving right now because I'll, I'll, I'll work for a while and I'll start to feel like I can feel it. It's almost like an, uh, an itch that, that uh, what I'm doing isn't what I've isn't exactly where I want it to be right now. And I think when it starts, it's a good, to me, that's an exciting time because it means that I've, I've gone through a lot of stuff that I wanted to explore, but now I'm looking, I guess, maybe deeper for something else, for something a little bit more, you know, or maybe not more, but different, you know? So I, is, that, is that a good answer? That was an awesome answer. Well, John, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You guys have been great. Bye bye. I was like, I would never follow. You. Yeah, I think Alan. Answer, like this happened. Uh, who wants to jump in next? Well, um, Alan made a lot of great points. I think part of it, I I remember when I was in art school, everyone asking the instructors, "So how do you how do you find your style?" And it was a 
popular question we all wondered and they just would shrug and say well it'll come and it, it comes after a lot of experimentation a lot of work i think the more work you get under your belt the the more you're going to get closer to where you are as an individual i remember one night in particular i was working on a job early in my career and i had other artists books all around the floor you know i was drawing on reference from all sorts of different artists and oh i'll put a maxfield parish sky in there and you know some nc wyeth clouds and you know all that stuff and i've kind of looked around and i thought you know what i can't do this anymore i've got to start doing my own homework and getting my own reference and then i'll i'll translate that and whatever comes out that'll be closer to what i want to say than trying to imitate somebody else's work. So it's still an ongoing process. I think you're really right, Alan. It's always evolving and you're always trying different things. Um, but I think making up your mind that you've got to kind of tear yourself away from the, the influences and the people you love at some point and just kind of start getting out there on your own and you know testing the waters and experimenting seeing which and i think that's a great point about um learning about uh you know when when things are uh, i guess what i was going to say with techniques and and materials and all that kind of thing you figure out what's comfortable for you i know there were a lot of times as i was learning that i think i'd have in the back of my mind some instructor or some other student saying well a real artist doesn't do that this is how a real artist works. And now I realize I don't know what real artists do, but I know this is what I do. And I know this is how to build a picture or make a painting. These are the steps I go through. And if somebody else does it differently, that's great. But for me, this is what works. So go ahead, jump in there, somebody. <laughs> I'll just stay, I've been dumping into the comments uh, or, or the chat uh, a few images from my college years, just where it's screen sharing here. But uh, that way, people can also just uh, look at them uh, for a little longer as well and download them uh, if they wish. But uh, that those are those are the different voices of of who I was coming out of college. Uh, I didn't know who who I was. Well, I you know, I wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know what kind of art I really wanted to do. And I had kind of was three directions: uh, illustration, which actually was the smallest portion of my portfolio uh, in terms of like fantasy style illustration, but comics, actually uh, narrative science fiction comics were a major passion and one of my largest passions in college. And then fine art uh, painting, realistic fine art painting, which is what I was at Syracuse University for in my undergraduate degree. So what what was interesting is that science fiction illustration and fantasy illustration is a merging of like the narrative work of comics with the realism of you know painting the human figure and guess where i wound up right is uh in that kind of and that's that's where uh basically once i hit the road doing that it ended up being a wonderful marriage of these two aspects of my artistic development and that so my voice wasn't so much something that I was seeking. It didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't go out there trying to emulate any particular person. Although I was certainly a sponge looking at like Jeff Duro's Hard Boiled when I was doing comics and looking at Caravaggio and Velasquez when I was doing fine art painting. But I wasn't trying to be like them. I was always absorbing and regurgitating what I took in and spitting it back out into my own stories. I think that was key, was telling my own stories. Yeah, I think to, to corroborate and, and echo, I, I think what everyone else is saying, uh, uh, I, uh, through, through a career of full-time teaching, uh, I dealt with that question a, a lot. Um, uh, can, you, can you show me how to draw like such and such? Can you show me how to create artwork like someone else? I'm wanting to uh, completely imitate a style. And uh, once, I, once I got my head around teaching, I figured out the correct answer for those students. And it was, uh, yes, I could probably show you that, 
but I won't. Uh, what I want to do is teach you how to pursue, pursue your own voice. Uh, I, I spent my early college uh, imitating a couple of artists. Uh, Peter Milton was my great hero when I was in college. Uh, and I spent, and I was, I was in Antalya, I was doing etching. And I spent two years imitating Peter Milton uh, until a professor uh, finally told me, that's great, now take what you can learn from that imitation and get back to your own work, uh, get back to your own pursuit, your own voice. Uh, and so, so I, I came to believe that, that uh, and, and, and taught over the years, that complete utter imitation uh, is a handicap uh, when you're developing, but letting your own voice emerge and learning by imitation along the way is an advantage. So I tell students, don't ever pursue a style to learn that style. Uh, your, your, your own voice will emerge as you, as you work and mature artistically. Uh, and uh, imitating a style uh, will, will limit you ultimately. But learning from imitation uh, is, is, I think, I still do that. I still will, will imitate certain artists uh, uh, briefly and privately, uh, and then take whatever I can from that and get back to my own, uh, back to my own path. So there's, there's a lot of crossover that we're hearing in all of your speaking about uh, imitation and inspiration from other people. And of course, as artists, we hopefully are constantly developing our visual vocabulary by um, studying in the museums and studying other artists' work and really seeing how other people do things. Just for clarity's sake, because we get asked this, what would you say to somebody that wildly admired you and was so inspired by what you do and wanted to be like a little mini you, what would you say to them about how to take that kind of burning inspiration that, that you're providing to them and use it to actually figure out where they're going? You've seen some of the comments in the chat where they're like, yeah, that's where I am. You know, I know what I like and I know what I'm inspired by, but I don't know. How, what's the next step? How do I, how do I go about starting to find or circle around, like Alan was saying, how do I start circling around what, what is unique to me and my voice? A couple of times I've, I've uh, heard that question. You know, I, I really love your work. How do I do that? Uh, I'll, I'll turn the question back. I'll turn a question back to the student or back to the, the young artist and say, what is it about that work you like? Uh, and therefore, it gives them something to ex extract, uh, some, some uh, detail or smaller gem to extract and take with them back to, back to, their, own, uh, back to their own track. Yeah, that, uh, to me, that exactly what Ed said, uh, that when, when earlier when I was talking about uh, uh, noticing the stuff that you notice and why you notice it, it it's exactly the, what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, for me, well, and then there's the other aspect of it that I think a lot of times it's a security thing. I think it's safe to emulate an artist because you have, you know, you have a map in front of you that you can, but I think most artists uh, who, who uh, are really on a path to finding their own voice will get bored with that anyway on their own. You know, they'll emulate or do copies of things for a while uh, and then it'll just start to be less satisfying to them. And then they'll start digging into it and finding out, you know, I, I think that happens a lot. Uh, they just, there's a phase that where a lot of people, I mean, most everybody does it, where you get to a point where you can go, oh, my work looks a lot like this person or that. Um, and then as it, as it gets, goes further, you, you start to, I think it's a natural thing to gravitate away from that towards that one little bit of it that you really need, you know, or you really want. If you were talking to a newer artist, and, you know, we're having this conversation about your own voice, your own vision. Would you recommend that they focus more on, say, our concert pianist? You start by focusing on the scales and learning the techniques of how you play the piano before you start trying to do your concerto or compose your own music. Would you recommend that somebody really focus on developing the technical side of the medium that they've chosen? Or would you recommend that they're kind of pursuing these things simultaneously? So they're really uh, developing the technical side, but they're also in the background somewhere constantly thinking about, you know, what is it that I have to say? What is it that I want to bring to the world? How would you recommend somebody start? Well, those are, I mean, I, I teach 
now online and I teach at the illustration masterclass where I've met Alan uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and done presentations at conventions where I you know, both met Ed and Scott and, and you guys as well. And so it's uh, that sharing of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? being aware of, I guess, even professional artists where we are now, all of us, we're still learning. So we're still in a way absorbing trying to learn techniques that might advance our capabilities, right? Different insights into narration. So it's not like it's a, a an end all be all to get there. So back to your answer, like technical or storytelling, right? Uh, I am a big proponent of first having something to say, right? Of working on what it is that you want to say and then your choices over technique, over execution, evolve from that message. So rather than learning, like just to say, I want to oil paint like Rembrandt, it's like, well, do you want to tell stories like Rembrandt or do you want to tell stories like a contemporary painter or do you want to be, you know, doing fantasy illustration? I mean, those are, there's different reasons why you want to embrace technical hurdles and for me it always feeds back to what was the story originating what was the motivation internally that originates why you want to make that piece of artwork or why you what 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 do you want to say so yeah technique certainly is very important right because uh, i'm sure we, like all of us now it's we don't have to worry about technique it, it flows out of us where it's no longer a hindrance so therefore Right now, like I'm, I'm so happy to be able to create paintings that I don't think about the problems that I would run into with rendering and oils, right? So that that opens up the the the, the floodgates, the, the the ease of progressing into very complex stories or ideas that I might not normally have undertaken. But even in the beginning of my career, it was more about the choices of what I wanted to say, and then finding the technical problems and, pro and problem solving those technicals to get to that story. I think that's a really important point uh, and, and is important to uh, il both illustration and concept art, uh, that, that story, a narrative uh, drives, can drive everything, <laughs> drives the look, it can even drive technique. Uh, and I found a lot of times that the story answers questions uh, if i'm if i'm lost or, or hit a dead end on something uh returning to the story will will uh, will frequently solve that problem and get me going again i think though from my point of view i think that um if you're talking to students in particular uh, and using the scales is a good example i think you you might want to play like mozart but you do have to learn the basics first if you want to get there and I think that there are certain things, draftsmanship and color and perspective, all those things go together to do the kinds of work that we do. And the more you have those things in your tool belt, the easier it'll be for you to, to say the things you want to say. So I, you'll, you'll learn as you express yourself, but you're also, uh, express yourself better if your toolkit is bigger. Uh, I guess yeah. So. yeah, actually, but as a good example, Scott, like when I was first starting out as an illustrator, uh, you know, my technical skills were really lacking in some areas. And so in order to paint a still life, rather than doing like a bowl of fruit, I did a knife, a wine glass, uh, uh, you know, a brass uh, mug. So because it, they were mystery novels and I wanted to get make money so doing mystery novel covers. so i was like totally like you know, like sold my soul right to the, to the cover, <laughs> making money on this but that's so that's an example like i okay i'm gonna do a still life but i want to do it i i, I want to do it with the material so i can learn how to paint metal better how i can see right. the effects of light and light through glass so i got a wine bottle uh and i i, I painted a dot like money uh, so I could understand the detail. How much precision can you put in to a dollar bill? Like what's necessary to make it look convincing and crumple it up a little bit. So these are all like they're, they're traditional, right? They're traditional forms of the still life, but I've brought them into my narration, my story that I therefore motivated me to throw myself into that 
technical execution so that I could embrace it more fully and, uh, and rationalize the, the time and labor to get there. What Donato was saying was speaking to what I was going to say about there. You know, for me, it's because uh, I have I do have people ask me a lot about you know they want me to give them information or or, or sort of uh, you know go into kind of a, a teaching position with them. Uh, and when I it's one of the things that I find sometimes difficult is I I because I do this on a kind of a one to one basis. It's a to me it's about what can I what can I see in their work? What can I see that they want to do? Like Donato will take his interest and wrap the foundational stuff around his interest so that he keeps his keeps him it keeps him in his chair right so whatever part of the learning process that you can get a hold of and, and bring it towards your interest the foundational stuff that you can bring your interest into whatever keeps you in the chair because it's being in the chair that actually teaches you all of this stuff uh it, you know you can you can you can work with a you know foundational you know composition or form and shape but you have to, to kind of move it in the direction that will keep you interested in doing it. Uh, there, Cause there's two different parts to it, right? There's the inspiration and the discipline and those aren't mutually exclusive, but they're sometimes different things entirely. Uh, and to me, whenever I look at, whenever somebody asks me, I try to find out what they're interested in, in terms of what they're doing. You know, when you say, what about this person's work is it that you're actually interested in? Like Ed was talking about earlier. Uh, and then I try to, push them towards foundational qualities that they can use to explore that, right? Uh, I'm not in any way, uh, you know, I don't have the teaching experience that everybody else does, uh, but I, I do get asked the question enough that it's uh, something that I've had to think about a lot. So when, we're, when you're talking, you're talking about your creative voice, your style, there's a lot of talk these days about branding, you know, that something becomes recognizably attached to your style. There's a question that is, is it bad to have different artworks that look super different one from another, although I'll speak to you. So if you had all these different artworks and kind of style variations, how would it be recognizable as being oh. from the same voice, the same storyteller? They don't have to be. Uh, you know, as again, this is uh, this is one of those as a, as a commercial illustrator, right? Yes, it is a good idea to have a narrower presentation for your potential clients, so they when they evaluate your work, they know, okay, I'm hiring you to solve this problem for my book or my interior illustration, my advertising. So they want to know what you're going to deliver, but it's okay to have multiple you know schizophrenic styles. Like that's good. Like that's great actually. Uh, but you don't want necessarily want to project them equally on your website and then confuse the hell out of a potential commercial client. Uh, so I, I would say keep it. And I actually, I'll share a couple more images of when I first started out of manuscript illumination that I loved and adored, but I never do it as an illustrator. Just nothing I really ever do. So there, that's my, <laughs> Anybody else? Are we good with that one? Uh, I am going to jump to this other question as well. So this is, I've heard many times that artists recommend you ask yourself, why does this get to me or why do I like this? And that's something that our panelists have already talked about. But I'm always afraid of not getting to the right conclusion. Like I'm just making up a reason just because it makes sense. Do you have any tips for getting to the right answer? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That may depend on, on whether the person asking the question is an early career artist or a student or, or a veteran. Uh, um, uh, because uh, 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 and returning, I think, to something that either Alan or Donato were saying earlier, uh, all of us continue to learn. And, and in addition to that, I'll add to that, uh, all of us continue to um, uh, run up against brick walls and get frustrated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm retired and I still uh, find that, that, um, that I can't, uh, sometimes I just can't uh, find my way out of a particular problem. Um, but in terms of getting to, to a conclusion, to, to the right conclusion, um, you know, uh, uh, how to suggestion, uh, uh, always uh, err on the side of working your way out of a problem. Don't try to think your way through a problem necessarily. Uh, and and um, and be be continually willing to take more chances. 
And uh, frankly, the computer helps with that, uh, with digital work. I do things on the computer uh, and will attempt things on the computer wildly, uh, wild chances that I would never do on a graphite drawing, you know, or, or that I would never do on a colored pencil drawing. Uh, I might I might scan the color pencil drawing, put it in the computer, and try it, and then see you see what happens. Then return to the to the, the traditional media drawing. Uh, but I'm not sure if that addresses the question or or, or not. Well, I wonder if maybe uh, uh, part of the answer might be, and it depends on where you are in the process as far as trying to find the solution. But I think one one thing that's helpful for me is to try it on a smaller scale in a quicker version. Thumbnails and sketches for me are a good way to kind of run through some basic ideas and see, okay, does that look like it's going where I want it to go? And kind of take it in steps as opposed to, I'm gonna sit down in front of this huge canvas and start painting or drawing and I'll find the answer by the time I leave the chair. You know, it's To me, it, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process. And Scott, you would include in that doing thumbnails halfway through the painting, right? Doing additional thumbnails to solve yeah, the problem. Yeah, if you run into a problem, yeah. uh, you know, at, at any point you can improve it <laughs> and make all, if you've got the time. Uh, it's always, there's, it's never too late until you hand it in. <laughs> I, I do studies uh, at all stages of the work that I do. Some, you know, I do a lot of graphite work, but even though I'm just doing graphite work a lot of times, I'll, I'll stop in the middle of it and do a, a study of some area or something that I want, which is kind of what I was going to speak to you about the actual question, uh, that it's sort of like when you talk about defining what you see in a piece that you like, that's another thing that takes practice. And the more that you look at things and, and then you maybe do a, a, that's what master studies are for too, right? So you see something you like, you do a little master, do a little study of it, and you'll determine through the study what it is that you're trying to bring out of it or see it, right? And, uh, and, and so, you know, as it goes along, you start getting, it starts getting easier for you to uh, heighten uh, your observations and, and defining what it is that's bringing you back to the piece. In my own work, I notice that if I'm working on something and I look at a certain area and I keep looking at it, it's either because it's working or it's something really wrong, you know, and, if, and sometimes I can't tell right away until I've gone back and forth with it a little bit. But, but I, I think... Uh, if you if you just keep at it and and do what 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 Scott said and what what Ed was talking about that uh, uh, it, it is a thing that requires practice observation requires practice that's that's why we do figure studies and stuff like that right so yeah. It's one of the things that we do as sculptor. We, we oftentimes say that the most important moment is because when you're done with, at the end of the day, you put the thing under a plastic bag and so you can't see it anymore. And the most important moment, like I don't ever pull that bag off when I'm thinking about something else. I get up, I have my coffee, I do what I have to do, walk the dogs. And when I walk into the studio and I see that bag, I'm totally focused on that. And I take the bag off and I turn it and whatever my first reaction is, what catches my eye, is usually something I have to address. A lot of times, you know, it will be something what Alan is talking about where something is dreadfully wrong right there. I find that it's very helpful to, um, you know, like I start wanting to fuss with it, <laughs> to fix it. Yeah. And usually it just needs to be like yeah. cut off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I wanted to say as we're, you know, talking about your creative voice, one of the things that I actually really admire about Colin throughout his career is he will become very um, obsessed with an idea or a, a series of imagery or um, a story. And he will be incredibly prolific and produce 100 paintings about that. And then it's done. Like, He's not inspired by that anymore. And it doesn't matter if the galleries want it and the collectors want it, he won't do it. Like he is done. He answered the question he had to answer in that series and he does something else. And um, I think that's really hard, like, because I feel like, well, I've invested all this time in developing the stories in this particular series. But I do think that there's a certain courageousness to say, you know, yeah, this, you know, when I come into the studio, I'm not like totally excited about what I'm doing at this exact moment. Like, I cannot wait to get in there to start this. It feels a bit more like work and drudgery where I'm like, mm, this has been successful and I should probably, you know, and I'm learning more and more just like to bail on those things. Sometimes it's a technical thing and I have to sort it out and that's different. But if like, I'm really 
moved beyond that story. Like I'm just trying to kind of prolong the story because I liked it. It's time for me to do something else. And I think that's one of the things that we do in our collaborations is we allow ourselves total freedom to do something that is totally whimsical and out of left field that we've never done before. And that includes the topic, it includes the theme, it includes the story, it includes the method, it includes the clay, it includes the finishing. We will launch into anything. And so I think one of the nice things about collaborating is we each have our own bodies of work and our own styles and the things that we wanna say. Um, Storytelling has been a constant thread through this whole weekend all over the place in Lightbox Expo. But it is nice to periodically give yourself that freedom, whether it's through doing sketches or, you know, little tiny, you know, composite things, or somebody was talking about Photoshop uh, mashups in the chat, you know, to give yourself freedom to explore other things, because you may discover other uh, rooms in the house of your voice, we might say. Yeah, I think that's a very good point uh, that you're making, is that it's like being willing, I think maybe Ed mentioned about exploring and and failing almost as well as you do this exploration, challenging yourself with new things and ideas. Uh, I mean, you see us all now uh, because we've been here decades working and we also, you also don't see, like I've been sharing some early work so you can see how my whole body of work has been culled from all these things that didn't quite fit. So I'm, I'm only showing, and you only see the face of many of us are the things that we want you to see, the things that provide a very consistent uh, representation of us as a professional artist, right? So you, yeah, being willing and, and open to that kind of exploration. And again, I, I was more of that ilk in the early part of my career. I was just trying anything, right, to make a, a career in the arts, to be able to do anything. And then eventually, luckily, I had a representative who helped focus me to become a, like a book cover narrative oil painting illustrator. And by those commercial choices of that narrowness is how I evolved my aesthetic. And, and so uh, people ask me like, oh, why don't you sculpt or why don't you do some watercolor? And it's like, why? Uh, like I'll just fail at that because I'm not, I'm not a much better oil painter than I'll probably ever be a watercolorist. So why even bother? Like it's, I, get, I think I wanted to point that out too. Is like, we all have come to accept that we are not going to be this other person, right? I am not going to be a comic book illustrator, even though as much as I passionately loved it uh, in my youth, also the pay is horrible now. So what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but, but that's a choice, like, okay, that doesn't mean I abandon everything I love about comics. It just means I'm not gonna be that type of illustrator anymore. I still heavily storytell. I still create complex narratives and environmentals and architecture and creatures and things and people, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna execute it with pen and ink and pencil, just like the way a comic book illustrator may or a graphic novelist might. Um, so that doesn't mean that I have to abandon those things, those identities of who I am as an artist. It just means that I've been comfortable letting those options fall to the wayside to concentrate on what I'm good at, what I still enjoy a lot of, and, uh, and what I can make money at as well as a, as a living illustrator. Let's be honest, like I, I need to make money to survive in this industry. And therefore I'm making choices to keep clients happy, keep commissions coming in and these are the choices you make as a, as a commercial illustrator I'd, I'd, I'd like to echo uh, part of what you said in the middle of that Donato and, and that is uh, uh, and, and and to address the bigger question uh, to find your voice I, I would I would prefer to call it uh, letting your voice emerge uh, as an artist as, as you progress um, but but uh, um, you, you, you have to be willing to flop. Uh, you have to be willing to to take chances, uh, uh, and uh, Christine uh, is really fun to hear. Uh, I think the very first part of your comment earlier uh, about um, how you'll you'll put something away, you put the plastic bag over, you come back the next morning and take a look at it, because I do exactly the same thing. Uh, I'll um, uh, I, I think when we when we work on something for hours and hours, uh, we become so invested in it. You also begin to forgive yourself. 
little problems and little mistakes <laughs> in the image. And one of the best ways to get back to seeing those, uh, two ways I'd recommend, number one is what Christine said, uh, put it away and come back the next morning. I do that and I'll even go back to my drawing board, uh, turn on all the lights. I don't let myself look at the image. I don't look at the drawing board. I turn on all the lights, I get my coffee ready, I get the music going. Uh, and then I'll turn and look at the image and react intuitively to it. Then you see things. Another thing I would add to that, try looking at it in a hand mirror, flip it horizontally. Uh, and I do that, I do the first thing in the morning plus the hand mirror sometimes at the same time. And the first time I look at the image that next morning with my coffee is in a hand mirror uh, and, and I see things in there, frequently the reaction is, oh crap, you know, now, now what am I gonna do? Uh, but, but, but it shows you things and remember that, that those little imbalances and little subtleties might be the things that someone else sees in your work the first time they look at it. Uh, and uh, they may be polite enough not to say it, but, but, uh, but they'll see it. And I think it works both ways too, because I do the same thing that you do, Ed, where I'll walk in and turn the lights on, but I don't look at anything. And sometimes uh, uh, I'll be very, the night before I've been very critical of something I've done, but when I come back the next day and I look at it again, it works the other way too, where I look at it and I go, oh, well, no, wait a minute, that's actually working okay. I just got too close to it. I was too myopic about, you know, how I was addressing the issues. And so it kind of works both ways, uh, which is good, you know, yeah. so, uh, because we tend to do that. We tend to, you know, get to a point where we've been focusing on the problems that we need to solve rather than looking at the totality of what we actually have in front of us. And sometimes, uh, you know, you can't go too far in one direction without the other. Right. You can't just look at the good stuff and not look at the problems and you can't just always see the problems and not look at the good stuff. So. And I think just in general, I think everything that's been said so far, I agree with. And I, I do to a certain extent myself. The, the first thing in the morning to look at it is always very enlightening. Um, but I also think just stepping back, getting away from it throughout the day, you know, taking a lunch break, uh, going to get coffee. Those few minutes or a few seconds when you look again at the picture are some of the most valuable seconds you're going to have during the day. And they always help. It doesn't matter if it's just sometimes even just turning and looking at the wall, if I'm having trouble with something and then looking again, it's like, okay. And it's that thing about if I keep going back to it, especially faces, things that are very critical. If I keep going back to a face when I'm looking at the picture, it usually means there's something wrong. Or if my wife comes in and I ask her what she thinks of it, yeah, that face looks pretty good. And I think <laughs> usually, okay, I got to work on the face some more. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I want to ask one thing because uh, a sculptor friend of mine once told me that, okay, so this is a reference for um, people who've been around longer, but he was saying that he felt like the creative stream was like a, a, a party line, which was a phone thing where you'd pick it up and anybody in the neighborhood could be on the phone. And he said that um, he thought of it as being this continuous conversation where we can jump in the conversation and jump out of it wherever we want. Have you ever been working on something that you're really excited about? You know, it's this idea that's just making your soul sing and you're working away on it. And then you go on Facebook or something and you see somebody is doing something kind of like similar. I just did that today. I never saw it. <laughs> I, I just did that today. I have in my sketchbook this little sketch of a wall that has a, a row of human teeth on it. And I went on to Instagram and there's a sculptor that actually incorporated that exact thing into a building. It's almost almost my sketch identity. And there's no way that we either one of us ever saw each other's work before. So it was just this parallel, like we're all drinking from the same well. You know, we've used that analogy before. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, I, it was funny because you mentioned that because I just like, 15 minutes before this, I showed Vicky the picture. It was, that's, that's fine. I've even suspected that there is some sort of weird telepathic connection out there. <laughs> when I come up with a great idea, what I think is a great idea, eight o'clock tonight, and I'll spend a couple hours working on it and work on it in the morning, and I'm really excited about it, open Instagram at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and someone else just did it. Yeah. You know. So when that happens, well, do you keep going with your idea or do you abandon it? What do you do? 
I, I tend to, to uh, put it aside and see if I can. I mean, if you're on a deadline, if you're on a client-driven deadline, you, you can't necessarily do that, but I tend to put it aside uh, and come back to it again uh, a day or two later and see if there's something else there that I can use and turn it back into my own narrative, my own story. Yeah, the same thing with me. With this piece I just saw today, uh, I, I asked myself, is there a reason for me to do the piece that I wanted to do now that that piece exists? Am I going to give something different? You know, and if I can honestly say that what I was going to, what I'm going to do is going to add, uh, it's going to be different enough that it, they don't look referenced for each, to each other, then I, I would pursue it, you know, and I'm pretty sure that I could probably take it in a direction that would still satisfy what I wanted from it and yet not be uh, what they wanted from what their, what their piece did, you know? That's something mm -hmm. we were talking about yesterday that there are many stories out there that have been told for eons, mythology and, you know, things with religion, so much so that we recognize all of the symbology and things. And it's, we feel like it's very important. You know, if, if you're totally inspired by mythology, by all means, explore that, but really look at what can I bring to this story that hasn't been brought yet? How can I bring something unique into the whole communication that's already been happening? So I'm not just repeating what's already been being set out there. Right. To me, I've thought about this a lot, that a lot of the ideas that I see that are great ideas have an archetypical feel to them. Like there's something about it that's always been there. Uh, and, and it's inevitable that those things are going to uh, you know, come together in other people's work and you have a parallel evolution. Because, I mean, archetypes are archetypes for a reason, right? Because they're in everybody's subconscious or, con you know, conscious mind. I think it's inevitable, but I also think it's great. You know, I love seeing things that are similar, but different enough that you go, these are actually about the same thing, but in, from two completely different perspectives or the other way around. They're two completely uh, different things, but from the same perspective that they relate to each other, right? So, yeah. yeah, I think um, it's a really fun experience when you look at some, some solution somebody came up with to a problem you may have dealt with in your own art, and you're like, man, that is so cool. I wish I had thought of that. Yeah, yeah. it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask a question from the chat from Catherine and direct this to all of you who've worked in the industry. I think it's very pertinent. How do you balance pursuing a style that appeals to you against the current trends and desires of clients and within the industry? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of can, I, 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 I do concept work, which has a certain formal, formal kind of system to it uh, and narrative stuff like uh, when I do book illustration. But I guess you could say that I do and that I compartmentalize them. Like I'll, I'll do, you know, formal stuff for con contractual work. And then my personal work is where I just let go and do all the stuff that, you know, I can't, that nobody really can pay me to do because I don't know. It's, it's personal. Hey, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, but, but uh, you know, these guys, uh, Scott and Alan and Donato are, are working at a level where, where um, clients and studios will come to them for their look. They want you know, they want what, what these guys do. Uh, if you're a young artist student or young artist starting out, trying to get a job, say, as a concept artist in a studio, in a game studio, uh, the, the, the question is, is important, it is legitimate. You have to work within the look of that particular product. Maybe not necessarily as a studio, but if it's a game, you, you, have, to, you have to create uh, a usable, uh, usable work that, that, that matches the look, uh, style, if you will, of that game. Uh, but I think the, 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 the best way to pursue that and achieve it is going kind of, kind of circling back to the beginning of our discussion. Uh, and that is to, to learn solid foundation skills, uh, learn, uh, you know, learn solid drawing, uh, composition skills, uh, uh, design, basic design, color theory. Uh, and it, with, with a really solid foundation, it then becomes much easier to plug into, uh, especially as a young person, to plug into the look of a, 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 uh, an established product, you know, established product in progress. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll second that, uh, what you're saying, Ed, and also uh, go, go back to what Scott had mentioned earlier about you know, develop, developing good chops, good technical skills. 
uh, that those are, you know, it, it's a catch 22, right? You, you, you need good skills so that you don't have to worry about your voice. It just evolves. And then how do you get your voice? How do you get those skills? Well, you do a lot of work, which means uh, like, right. How do you, it's a cycle. And the only way you get through it is by just hitting that road and making art, making another piece. Uh, I can certainly say my greatest, some of my greatest, uh, the aspect of developing my voice was in a way I wasn't thinking about it, but I was just doing so many book covers, so many commissions, so many trading cards that I just had to solve new problems every single time. And that's partly what I kept doing was adding, I call them curveballs, little problems. Like, have I painted a snow scene yet? Have I done something in the rain? Have I done a dark nighttime sky? Uh, how about three figures? How about four? How about 10 uh, in my composite, right? I mean, these are laughable, right? You laugh, but if that's what got me into challenging myself so that the voice of what I liked to do allowed me to leave those other choices off, right? Cull them off. And then my voice was things I really loved doing, things that I was getting hired to do uh, and things I repeated again and again in my work. So yeah, it's a, in the beginning, you're in that catch-22 phase of technical skill, style and work and internal voice, and yet still solving the client's problems. Like you're saying, Ed, you need to, need to hit notes. So you got to hit a certain look, a certain marketplace uh, expectation of what you have to deliver as a, as a commercial artist. Yeah, it's tough. It's not, it's not, there's no easy, it's not an easy answer. I'm kind of jumping around in the questions because as you guys are talking, you're, um, you're kind of touching on elements of uh, many yeah. of the questions that have been asked. So I'm hoping that uh, the attendees are feeling like they're having their questions answered appropriately. This one I feel is a very, uh, like a heart question, like heart, not hard. It is hard too, but um, do you have advice for someone who's struggling developing their voice because of shyness or anxiety, like not feeling that you have anything worth saying? That's actually one of the questions I copied off the chat line and, and put in my own notes uh, to, to address if we got the chance. Um, it's difficult. And, and I, uh, when I was in college, um, I was very reticent to show my work to anybody. One big difference, there are a lot of differences between me and Donato. One big difference is that you will never see anything I did in college. I will <laughs> never show anybody anything. Uh, but, but, um, I think uh, one of the things that helped me when I was first starting out uh, and, and, and nervous about showing my work was to get involved in smaller sized groups. Uh, I suppose it could be online. My, mine were person to person. We used to do sketch nights. We would go to a bar or a cafe and do sketch nights with people, with like-minded people, people who were maybe, maybe the definition is the same level of nervousness I was at the time, um, and start sharing your work with those people. And that, that can snowball. It, it, can, it can create uh, an encouraging small atmosphere that, that might give you courage to take the next step up and the next step up and eventually uh, go, go, very, go completely public with your work. And I think that if you have a, a need, or if you, if you have a need to say something, there's somebody somewhere that wants to hear it. Uh, you know, every, all of us, you know, we have our favorite artists. And I'll tell you that I have yet to run into an artist of any level, really, that didn't have somebody that thought they were their favorite artist. You know, everybody, you're, you're going to be somebody's favorite artist, no matter what. And, and it, to me, because I do the same thing, I'll look at what I'm doing and go, is it, Am I doing something that needs to be done? Is this not something that I've said before? But then, or is this something somebody else has said, you know, in their work? And I think, but I haven't said it. And maybe I'll say it in a slightly different way that'll make, make meaning for somebody else in a different way, you know? So. I think, yeah, following up on the validity of your voice, uh, don't feel like you have to make some kind of statement with every piece. Like it has to be some, major social, political, conceptual statement. Uh, I see art, some artists uh, that feel like, <laughs> Christine, who do you do? Yeah. Uh, like it, it just like, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, you know, admittedly, if it can feel good if you do feel like you, you hit that statement and it came out, but sometimes just 
making something simple and that you're interested in, that you want to celebrate. Uh, and that's actually, uh, I kind of shared an early drawings that I would do from Lord of the Rings. Uh, so I just wanted to make simple drawings. I didn't want to have to do an oil painting and say, this is the world of Middle Earth. I just said, I want to do a little life drawing like Gandalf or, or, or characters or Aragorn and not have to worry about the big statement of the image. And I would just do these and do them again and do them. And now I have hundreds of them and I put them in collections and books and I sell them at conventions. And it's this extra stream of voice that I now have that I'm now getting commissions for to do interior art and illustrated books all based on this style that evolved because I just wanted to do something really simple, not make a statement. So your voice can come out of just things you like to do, do a still life, paint a flower, paint the animals around you, do like something, paint a face. It doesn't have to have crazy backgrounds and environments. Uh, it, it can evolve. And what you do is you do that again and you do it again. And that's what's important, being prolific in that sense of, of revisiting your interests so that that one painting turns to three, turns to six, turns to 12 over time. And then you start making choices that inform it and evolve it and grow. And then your voice kind of comes from that. That's what I believe. Can I interject? Uh, Nobody. What, as you were talking about that, the thing that occurred to me that kind of sums up the way I feel about it is that what people want to hear is less important than what you need to say. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a, it, to me, it's, it's the whole point of all of this, going through all of the different work that I've done is get to a point where I can literally get to eventually do the work that I feel like I wanted to do. Like from the beginning, I just didn't know it, you know? And it's, it has less to do with like uh, people assessing what I say is valuable and more like, oh, I just really want to do this. I want to have fun with it. You know, just like what you said, Donato. It's like, it's, it's, it, you got to retain that joy of just having fun with it. You know, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever psychologically it, it, it gives to you, you know, don't let that go. Yeah, and I think we would just add that nobody will ever go through this life with your experiences, your upbringing, the things you think, the things you love, the things you've seen, the things you smell. And maybe your story, kind of relating to what Donato was saying is, you know, saying to all of us, hey, stop for a sec. Look how beautiful this little dewdrop is on this rose petal. You know, this is what I want to communicate to you. Yeah. But your voice is important. And we believe that if you feel an internal pull to create things out of clay or paint or to draw or to sing or to dance or to make music, it's not a fluke. There's a reason. You may have holes in your swing that you need to fill in through learning and developing and giving yourself time and patience. But it's, it's not a fluke. There's a reason why you have that creative impulse. And we need <laughs> what it is that you have to say. We need, the creative community needs your contribution to this conversation that we are yeah. all part of and we're all putting out there because someday we're going to see your work and we're going to be like, wow, that's really profound. Yeah. The, the the world needs what we all can do, including uh, uh, people who are who are young, just starting out, and don't feel uh, like they necessarily have a voice at this time. Uh, at, at another question I noticed on on the line was, um, um, "Is it okay if I'm pulling questions off the?" Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. I just okay, want okay. everybody to be aware that we know that we are um, kind of at time, but um, do feel free to stick around as long as the panelists are okay hanging out. Are you guys all sure. just for a couple extra minutes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and just real quickly, uh, notice you know, the, the question basically is, is um, uh, um, how do you recommend dealing with the feeling that you don't really have, I don't really have an artistic voice? Um, keep working and keep keep living and and that will come around uh notice that that nobody on this panel sorry to throw you all under the bus guys nobody on this panel is young uh, <laughs> nobody on this panel is 22 you know 24 except maybe colin yeah um, 
uh, <laughs> and 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 I think we all, I think we each have taken. I think I can speak for everyone that we each have taken a pretty long, fairly winding paths to get where we are. Uh, and, and and at least for me, uh, I am not now where I was convinced when I was 24 I would be later on. You know, uh, things happen, opportunities came up, uh, doors closed, doors opened, uh, and and um, and here I am. I'm perfectly happy with it. Um, I am going to just give the other panelists an opportunity. If you want to say anything to kind of wrap everything up, uh, feel free. Well, I, I'll say that it's been a joy uh, uh, being on the panel, and every every time you guys have hosted a panel, it's uh, it's been as informative for me as anything else that I've ever done. So, uh, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so grateful to all of you guys. And I find that I probably didn't say a word because I'm, I'm enthralled <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, oh, they have the best answers. We're There's, sitting at the feet of pastors. <laughs> I'm, we're so grateful that you could come and uh, share your wisdom with everybody, yeah. including ourselves. I, I was just gonna say it was, it was a real pleasure to be here and I agree with everything everybody said. And I, uh, I learned a lot just being here. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I'll, I'll just finish up saying uh, uh, kind of like I did yesterday is to reach out to those of you who are watching here is to share your work. Get out there, you young artists, you new artists. Uh, it doesn't have to be young, new, uh, whatever you're sharing, you know, new styles, new approaches, put it out there. Get it out in other eyes, other people's communities. We talked, you know, get, find that community, find a place to put it and, and celebrate it. And you don't have to have likes. To, to, to validate it. What you need to do is just put it out there and, and do it again. Uh, and then validation comes through that process. So please do that. Please share your passions with the rest of us and people will notice. Thank you. Um, we're gonna wrap this up and say thank you so much to all of the attendees for coming. And I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. We very much enjoyed the conversation. Uh, uh, all of you, uh, we're, we're just so grateful uh, to count you among our friends, uh, but also for your talents and your skills and how, uh, how you're willing to share with us the community. And we're gonna say right now, you are all fabulously brilliant. Yes. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.